Hey everyone. My dog always decides to loudly drink exactly when I start the live session. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the sound of my dog drinking. Um, he's usually either drinking or sleeping or letting us pat him, which is nice. Uh, wait, waiting for to get critical mass. I see Gretchen's there. Gretchen, I'll, I'll loop you in in just a minute. Just want to get get a bunch of people here. And as you are, I know this is backwards to you, but here is Gretchen's book, The Four Tendencies, um, which the lesson today was taken from. And um, again, backwards to you, but motivation to get this book. Here is the diagram that lists the four types and their mottos and their their general um, general traits. So, all right, um, Gretchen, when you are ready, send a request. I think you probably did already to get in. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Hey everyone. Yeah, let me know where you're here. Hi. Hey. Thank how are you. you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm so happy to be talking to you on this you Monday. Mean, yeah, thank you. So um, I wanted to, I, I usually start with a, a little bit of a, a review of what we've done so far and how it fits into what's happening now. And so we've been doing this three weeks now, amazingly, uh, and the, the tips have really built on, on each other. Um, and what was great about starting the week this way is that yours was the first to say, all right, you, you know, sort of like you, you have all this information about how, what things can help people. Now let's figure out what your personality is going to be more oriented towards. So which kinds of tips will work for you? And so I love the idea that I, I'm hoping that quarantine writing hour can be something that works for all of these types, as long as people give themselves the kind of, the, the okay to do it the way they need to do it. Uh, so thank you, that was a great way to start this week. I, I'm wondering if we can, uh, if, if you might, and I know this might be a big ask, be able to talk a little bit about each tendency and how you can imagine the, the like each of these tendencies finding a way to get a project done. So a lot of the people who, so we, we have a, a variety of people on here. Some people are writing um, for pleasure. Some people are writing, you know, work projects that they absolutely have to get, get out. Like for example, an email to their organization, which is not an easy thing to write no. right now. Uh, some people are working on books. We have poets, we have musicians, but people doing it for different reasons, but everyone wants to get something done. They do want to complete something. So wondering if you could give us a bit of advice about what kinds of tips you think apply for each of these types. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think the first thing, and you pointed this out, is to recognize that your desire to do it, your motivation to do it, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with whether you're gonna successfully do it or not. And I think some people think if they whip themselves into a frenzy, or they castigate themselves for their procrastination, that somehow that's gonna help them move forward. It doesn't really work like that. I think we're much better off saying, well, what kind of person am I? And what kind of mindset, what kind of vocabulary, what kind of framework sets it up well for me? So for instance, you said like, you think that this could work, your, your quarantine writing hour could work for everyone if they did it in the right way. I think that's absolutely true. For, so rebels are people who like to do things in their own way, in their own time. They tend to not like calendars. They like to be spontaneous. They don't like to feel trapped. So this is something that's great because it's like, if I feel like joining Amy and everybody, I'll do it. If I don't feel like it, I'll just go my own way. It's there when I want it. Maybe I'll tune in later. I'll do it when I want. So they can do it. But if they start saying them to themselves, what's wrong with me? All these people are doing it live. I can't do it. The minute I hear that we're supposed to be there at this time, I refuse to do it. I'm not a real grown up. What's wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you. This is just a thing. Rebels don't like to work that way. So do it your own way. Do it when you feel like it. You might be working at 2 a.m. If that works for you, that's great. So rebels have to do, they have to remind themselves, this is what I do, this is what I choose. This is my identity. I'm an artist, I create, or I'm an academic. I wanna put my ideas out into the world. Of course I wanna work on my PhD. You know, it's like, who am I, what do I want? Now, obligers, they need that outer accountability. They need to feel like somebody's eyes are on them. 
And so this is great because it's like, we're all going to do it. People are counting on me to join in, to create that sense of momentum, to create that sense of like, we're all in it together. If I don't show up, then other people may, be, may not feel like they need to show up. And then none of us will get our work done. So I'm going to show up for other people and they're going to show up for me. And so that's going to help me. Um, even the fact, Amy, that you're kind of like scrolling through the comments, it makes people feel like, wow, she notices if I'm here, she'll see if my <laughs> name's out there. That's good because obligers need a outer accountability. And it might be that someone's very puzzled right now because they're like, I never have this problem at work. Yeah, because at work you have your team, you have your boss, you have your deliverables. Everybody's right there with you. Now that you're off on your own, you might struggle. And that's completely normal and to be expected. There's nothing wrong with you. That's not unusual. That's just a thing that some people are challenged by. So the answer is, okay, given that that's your challenge, how do you create the tools that will help you deal with that challenge rather than thinking that there's anything wrong with you? And questioners for them, it's why. Why am I going to do it for an hour? Why am I going to do it at this time? Why am I listening to her? And it's like, experiment. This might work for you. This might not. This is a tool that works for other people. Maybe it won't work for you. Maybe you customize it for yourself. Questioners love to customize. Um, for them, it's like, is this an efficient way? Is this a good way? If I get started, it's easier to continue. This is a great way to get myself started. This gives me a little structure. I like structure. For questioners, it's all about, well, why would I do it? And the more they're connected to like, well, why is this the right thing for me? The more connected they will to do it. So I think you're absolutely right. This is a tool that is, it's, it can take its shape from the person who needs to use it. Um, you're putting it out in there in the world, which I think is great. But I think people should think about, okay, well, given this, how do I make it work best for me? Because just the fact that it would work really well for Gretchen this way doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work for me this way. Okay. So uh, I, I, you started with Rebel, which I was glad for, because I think that's the one that people are the most confused about. It's like, if they think they're a rebel, they're, th they're the most perplexed thinking, mm -hmm. well, what will motivate me? Yeah. So if, if, you know, they resist outer in expectations and inner expectations, does that mean they're more purpose driven? You know, what, what or, or is that an inner expectation? I mean, you, they resist, but they sometimes give in. Do they give in sort of begrudgingly? Well, this is the big thing because rebels are, they're often very frustrated this by this themselves. They're like, I decide to give up eating bread. And then the next day I go out and I eat an entire loaf of sourdough because I'm not going to tell myself what to do. I don't listen to anybody telling me what to do, including myself. <laughs> Even so myself. The thing, so the thing for a rebel, there's a couple of different avenues that you can go down if you're the rebel or you're trying to talk to a rebel. One is this identity. I'm an artist. I'm a productive person. I'm a reliable employee. I am a researcher who has ideas that are important to share with the world. So what do I do? I do what an artist does and an artist creates. What, is a, what does an academic do? An academic creates work that others can draw from. That's my identity. I have to do the things that are consistent with my identity because I want to be true to myself. So that's a very powerful idea for rebels. Also, the idea for rebels is information consequences choice. If I don't get this report in on Friday, then that's going to reflect very badly on me. Do I want this to be the particular time in the world where people are thinking that maybe I'm not a great employee? No, actually, that's really important to me. I want to keep up my reputation. I want, I want everybody to feel like I can do good work. So I'm going to do it because I don't want the consequences of not doing it. But often rebels can, um, the more they can do it in their own way, the more that they can feel like they have control of it, the more they're going to feel like doing it. And so, um, like, I have a friend, um, uh, Amy, I'm sure you and I know many nonfiction writers, and I have a nonfiction writer who's a rebel. And with nonfiction, you usually submit a book, uh, like with a first chapter and an outline. You don't typically write the whole book the way you would if you were a first-time novelist. And this rebel, said, and I, rebel wrote the whole book and then tried to sell it. And I said, well, that's interesting. Why did you do it that way? Because usually people save themselves the trouble of writing the whole book until they get their, you know, until they get their deal. He said, oh, well, I know if once I have an agent and an editor asking me, like, where's the book? When's it going to be due? Like, where's that chapter? Then I'm not going to want to write it. But right now I want to write the book because I want to write the book. It's fun for me to write the book. And once I've written the book, I'm like, I want my book to be published. I'd like to get paid for it. I want people to see how smart I am. So he structured it in a way that he could do what he wanted in his own way, in his own time. He didn't have people looking over his shoulder. He didn't have people telling him what to do because he knew that would interfere with him. So he got the same thing. He got the book published just like, just as anyone would have done, but he did it in a way that was customized to not ignite that spirit of resistance that sometimes can 
get in the way of rebels kind of moving forward with their goals. So in a way, identity, I, I was thinking of identity as a kind of um, inner expectation, but it's not really the same as an expectation. Right. When inner expectation is something where like, I'm going to keep a New Year's resolution. I'm going to make a promise to myself and I'm going to keep a promise to myself. A rebel is like, I don't make promises to myself because like, I don't know what I'm going to want to do. You know what I mean? They don't have that sense of expectation. It's more like I'm putting myself out into the world. Right. And so, so if, but your identity matters to you. Yes. And it also matters that other people see you, see that identity or see you as that, that thing. Absolutely. Is that right? Absolutely. And so that's what you want to put into the world. Now, one of the things I will say about rebels is that they like all of the tendencies. This is only goes to your tendency. So people can look wildly different. Like two of, if you know Game of Thrones, Arya Stark is a rebel and Cersei Lannister is a rebel. They both share rebel, but it takes into very different places. So, um, so with all the tendencies, your values, your interests, your temperament really shape how you look in the world tremendously. And like with rebels, some rebels want to be respected leaders, some want to make a lot of money, some don't really care. Um, some have a very high value on serving other people, being considerate citizens, being, uh, you know, ha serving others. Yeah. Others don't really care. Turns out that makes a really big difference with a rebel. So you can't look at somebody and say, oh, this person's irresponsible or this person's creative or whatever, because you have to know, well, why is the person doing that? And, and, what is, and, and, and uh, you have to know what their, their, their values are before you can anticipate what direction that would lead them in. I think that's, that's great I mean, because I, I do think when, as a social psychologist, which is sort of like the complement to personality psychology, you know, social psychology is really about how do social forces shape you? And personality psychology is about how do you shape yourself? How does your disposition shape you and your behavior? Um, that's an interesting, I never thought about framing it that way. That's an interesting kind of I mean, mirroring. They, yeah. they, they used to be in the same departments, oh, social and personality psychology. And it's the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, the Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin. They're always together. And, and the, but the funny thing is that they were sort of, they're together, yet seen as in conflict with each other. And I think they even see themselves sometimes as in conflict with, with each other. When we know, when you look at longitudinal research, you know, twin studies, all, all of the work, in the end, it looks like we're about 50% disposition personality and about 50% the power of social forces, right? Our behavior is shaped kind of equally by, by those two things. So a great study would, you know, it, it, a great research study would be including both of these things. And that's what you're saying. You're saying, get a sense of your tendencies. That doesn't mean it's the only thing that's shaping you, but you need to understand how these tendencies interact with these social forces. Yeah, and I think what happens is a lot of times when something doesn't work for somebody, they blame themselves. They're like, well, everybody can use a to-do list, so there's something wrong that's with right. me. Or, you know, my husband can just get up and work on his PhD thesis for two hours in the morning on his own, and I can't do that. I must be lazy or I must not have any willpower. It's like, no, 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 these, this is just the different people need different structures. People thrive under different circumstances. It's just like morning people and night people. Some people naturally wake up early and are high energy in the morning. Some That's people are naturally say. like more high energy later in the day. It's like these things, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's often more helpful to think about, well, how do I suit my environment to me rather than why can't I fit the mold that other people fit into? And I have to say, I got this wrong for many, many years. I fit into the upholder tendency, and I, which is the kind that, really like is pretty good at forming habits and keeping resolutions, which is probably the reason that I've written books about resolutions and habits, because I'm right. very drawn to that. And I kept thinking, well, if other people would just do what I do, then they would have this, the success that I do. And finally, I woke up one day and I was like, that obviously isn't true, because otherwise everybody would be doing everything the same. Obviously, people thrive in different environments. Look at accountability. Some people need outer accountability. They have to have it in order to move forward. Other people chafe under outer accountability. It actually makes them less likely to be able to come up with something, you know, to do something if they feel like somebody's supervising them or looking over their shoulders or ch constantly checking in on them. Well, you can see that this would lead to a lot of problems because if you have a boss who's like, everybody needs accountability, let's have a weekly meeting. Well, if some people are actually turned off by that, that's not good for anybody. Or if you're trying to get your kid to do your homework and like, you're, you know, you, you've got your clipboard out, which is my instinct, and other people are like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do it that way. It's like, don't keep trying the thing that's not working. Try to right. figure out how to suit, suit the circumstances to the individual. 
and that, that, that you know, I was thinking about that. It's, it's funny that you raise morning and, and morning and nighttime people because that's the example that I often think of as you know, people are pretty divided, right? I mean, the population yeah. is pretty divided on that. But there is a, there is a sort of moral high ground that's attributed to morning people. Yes, and there is. We were once doing a study. This was twenty years ago on uh, how minimal we call it. We call it minimal the minimal groups paradigm, where a min, a minimal identification, so something really tiny that still gives you an identity. Like I'm wearing a red shirt and I'm a red shirt person and that person's wearing a blue shirt. So that's a minimal identity. We wanted to know, you know, how does that affect whether people prefer in-group or out-group members? And it turns out people prefer their group even if it's a completely random and arbitrary identity. So yeah. for example, if you have subjects come in and you flip a coin and you say, okay, the people who got heads go into that group, people who got tails go into that group. It turns out in the experiment when you give them an opportunity to distri distribute um, assets, they give more to the, the heads people, give more to the heads people, the tails people give more to the tails people. So we were trying to come up with other minimal groups. And we thought, well, morning and, and nighttime people, that's a minimal group. It wasn't. People it's a huge group. People thought the morning people were better people. Oh, really? <laughs> and, and so they gave more to the morning people. They rewarded them for being morning people. Interesting. And uh, so I'm wondering about, you know, how do you get away from that? When you know, once when you look at this and go, okay, and it's funny, I go back and forth between thinking I'm a questioner and a rebel. Yeah, there's that's a they overlap. Yeah. So, so if somebody, I'm, if I asked you to do something, Amy, would you feel more like why should I, or would you feel like mm, you're not the boss of me? It depends on who you are. If, uh, then you're, you're probably a questioner. So if if you're if I mean if you asked me to do something, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I better get this thing done. No, but so but, that's but you're a questioner like, because you're saying you think you already asked. Me? <laughs> yeah, but so, see, that's a questioner, though, because you're saying, why should I listen to you? Right. So that's it's not questioner. like, what's the logic? It's do it's I, your, do I respect your, it's and your care impulse. about this it's, Yeah, it's like, what is your question? Your question is, why would I, why would I do what you asked me to do? Okay. But the so, rebel so, is like, it doesn't matter who you are. I'm not going to do it. You, know, you can be my mom. You can be my boss. You can be my doctor. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's where they're coming from. You know, so probably, but you might be a questioner who tips to rebel. That's what Steve Jobs was. So that's a tendency, which is when you're a questioner, but you got your, 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 you tip into the rebel zone. Yeah. That's um, interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, I, mean, I, 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 I resisted yoga for, mm -hmm. for ages and I was a professional ballet dancer. So people were like, why don't you do yoga? Yoga is so great. And I was like, I, and I, I knew, I knew why I didn't do yoga. It was because everybody was asking me why I don't do yoga. And I was like, well, that, you know, I, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> now right. I am. But at the time I didn't. But then, given that I study body language and how, how our, body, our body language affects how we feel, and suddenly there was a mountain of evidence showing that yoga has really great demonstrable, you know, evidence-based uh, effects on the brain then I was like I should do yoga by the way I still haven't gotten into that routine but my attitude toward yoga completely changed when I felt like it was from a, a credible place right so that's questioner because it's like give me the data give me the research show me the reasons yeah, yeah. sorry I don't uh, want to get too focused uh, on no no no, no but, but I think that's a great example because if like if I were trying to persuade you to do yoga I would be guided by the knowledge that that's what you would find persuasive whereas if you were an obliger I might say Amy, I love this yoga class. It'd be so much more fun for me if you came. Why don't we go together? And you're going to be like, oh, I have to go because Gretchen makes me go. And then you go and you love it. Or I could be like, um, but Amy, you've been saying for years you want to try this. Think about, think about your duty to your future self. At the end of the year, future Amy's going to be so disappointed if Amy doesn't give it a try. And you're like, yeah, I got to do it for my future self. Or you can make a deal like, okay, Gretchen, you try meditation and I'll try yoga. And if you don't try, if you don't try the meditation, then I don't have to try yoga. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I have to do it now because I want my friend to try something that I think is going to work for her. So you do with obliger. And with Rebel, you're like, whatever you want, man. You know, a lot of people can't do yoga. It's hard for a lot of people. So maybe it's not right for you. Like if you're not, if you're not up to it, um, maybe you don't want to do it. But if you felt like it, it's cool. And then just let it go and then the rebel can get there on their own time but the more you're like you said you would do it your doctor said you would do, do it you know you promised me you would it's like nah, i'm not going to do that i'm going to do it because i want to do it or because yeah. i'm the kind of person who would do it i love i love i'm an athlete i love to i love to test my body i love to feel vital and free i love to experiment with new 
forms of exercise and music. I love to try new things. That's who I am. That's why I do it. How do you, do you have any sense of how the, the, the quarantine, I mean, the, the social isolation, it affects these different types? Um, well, that really goes more to like extroversion, introversion type things. I will say though that like for upholders, upholders uh, definitely, um, uh, they, they gravitate toward things like to-do lists, calendar scheduling, and they tend to find energy and comfort in that. And so I don't know, but I'd be curious to know if, if you have other upholders um, uh, watching who would like give me a thumbs up if you, if you agree. Yeah, that upholders, I find, just yeah, let us know I, if you're an upholder. Yeah, yeah. I find that I, I try to comfort myself by being very, very strict and like having a schedule for my day, even though I don't need one. And I still go to sleep and wake up at exactly the same time. And I, you know, I quit sugar years ago and, and people are like, oh, well, now that you're doing this, are you quitting sugar? I'm like, 100% not. Because for upholders, there's often comfort in, in, in habit and routine and kind of execution. It's important for upholders to realize that other people don't feel that way. They may feel more comforted by like loosening expectations or kind of taking it easier on themselves. It took me a long time to understand that as an upholder, like me marching around with my clipboard was not the best thing to do. Um, now, sometimes there's, there have been, I've heard a lot from my audience about, um, especially questioners and rebels who were not doing uh, physical distancing to the same degree that others felt was proper. And that was leading to a lot of conflict, especially within households. And so again, you have to, with the, with the questioners, it's like, why are you gonna do this? It's, you have to explain why it's not arbitrary. You have to show an authority that this person accepts. Maybe you accept this authority, but somebody else denies that person's authority. Well, then they're not going to do what that person says or what that, that organization says. You've got to find what they're going to do. I think now the research is so over, you know, it, it's pretty, there's a lot of unanim unanimity. Um, and with rebels, a lot of times they just don't like being told what to do. And so if you, and you could ignite the spirit of resistance. And the more you say something like, well, you know, you can't stop off at the grocery store on your way home. You can't do that. Then they, it just makes them that really like really can bother a rebel. So again, it's going to the identity, it's going to information yeah. consequences choice. Somebody said to me, so information consequences choice, she said that her rebel husband was refusing to observe physical distancing. So she got an Airbnb and moved out for three months. <laughs> I mean, that, that's what she I was like, it. that is, that's outside the box, you know? And that, that's probably a rebel who didn't have a high value of um, consideration for other people or, you know, Right. whatever um but i think for the rebels it's hard for them when there are these rules where they're told where they can't i mean i'm not saying they can't do it because i've heard from many rebels who are like of course i do it because i'm a i'm like a, i'm a thoughtful citizen and i'm a right. considerate you know person 100 percent. but i think it might bother them more you know i think it's more annoying to them um okay. and it's you know it grates on them more than someone like me who's like you know oh here i am just like bustling around like you know with my to-do list <laughs> So somebody um, said, any tips on giving advice to rebels? I feel like whatever I recommend they, they do, they do the opposite. Well, yeah, that's very common. my thoughts okay. without triggering that response. Well, on my site, GretchenRubin.com, there's a ton in there about using the four tendencies. And there's a, a lot of it is specifically about rebels because, because rebels are really the most different from the other three tendencies. And this, so this tends to come up a lot. But I think your question contains your answer. The more you ask, the more you remind, the more you nudge the more you will ignite the spirit of resistance. And it's quite common for rebels to say, I was 100% about to do X, Y, Z, and then someone told me to do it, and so I won't do it, because I'm not gonna let you control me. It's very common, if you see that a rebel is not fulfilling something, it's because you keep telling them to do it. So, uh, and I'm, this is very hard to do, just staying silent, keeping out of it, letting them do their work in their own way, this is very difficult to do. It can feel, you have to let negative consequences fall on them. This is very hard to do. Sometimes negative consequences are gonna fall on you as well. That's a very, very difficult situation. But whenever possible, you wanna just give them the information that they need, tell them the consequences of their action or inaction, and then just let them decide to do what they wanna do. Now, another thing that can work with rebels is sometimes they will choose to do something out of love for you. So I'm not, I'm not doing social distancing because you're telling me to. I'm not doing it because the news tells me to. I'm not doing it because the governor tells me to. But when you look me in the eye and you say, I can't sleep at night. I'm so worried. All I want to do is wash my hands. I can't think about anything else. I just, I have bad dreams at night. Please, can you do this for me? Yeah. Sometimes they will say, I will choose to do it. I okay. love for you. And that's a choice. That's not doing something because it's expected of them or because they were told to.
Okay, here's another great, that's, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, somebody said, I'm an obliger, but don't want to ask for help slash accountability because I don't want to fail or feel shame in front of other people. Yes, okay. So you're in a pickle because what obligers need is outer accountability and the way that you will succeed is without her accountability, right? So you, that, is, that is how you will succeed. So what you need is some kind of outer accountability where maybe um, it's, uh, it's maybe with people that you don't know. So like I have an app called the Better App and people form accountability groups there. And so you have accountability to a real person, but it's just a person on a website. It's not somebody that you actually know. And so I think for some obligers who feel the way you do, that feels like enough expectation that they can that they can follow through but not so much that it feels upsetting also for some obligers like you they really don't want accountability that is a negative accountability and it may be that somebody in your life was so harsh on you that now you just cringe and can't bear the thought of any kind of criticism but one another form of accountability is praise and so you could say to somebody i want you to praise me every time i get it right but don't, don't castigate me if I get it wrong. And so this is somebody who's like, gold star for you. Oh my gosh, you've been trying to quit snacking at night. And last night you did it amazing. And then if you're like, well, not, you know, the night before that didn't go so well, they're like, well, you know what? You're getting it right. Like you're making progress. Like accountability also often comes with a positive. And so you might want to set it up so that you're getting positive accountability, but that you tell the people, I really need you to be really, really soft pedaling the negative accountability. Other people do fine with negative accountability. They kind of want the, you know, the kind of um, boot camp. Um, so again, obligers need outer accountability, but the kind of outer accountability that works for them, um, you might want professional accountability, like, an, like a, a writing coach or an executive coach or, you know, a professional organizer, or there's all kinds of people who are coaches because what they are, they're professional accountability keepers. They, you know, and then, and then it's just very straightforward. Of course, you're paying for that, which maybe you don't want to do, but they, they sort of know how to do this. And so it might be easier to take it from them because it just feels like, well, we're just having a professional relationship. It's not like you're mad at me because um, you work for me. Right. You're helping me. You're keeping me accountable, but I don't have to feel ashamed. Um, maybe I'm like, oh, I'm wasting my money if I'm not moving forward, but probably you will move forward if you have that accountability. I, so what I think what's interesting, that ties into um, what Dr. Ken Carter said last week. He was on, um, on Thursday and he, one of the things he talked about, okay, so we, we've talked about do you, giving your writing to other people for feedback and yeah. that that's generally a good thing to do. And he refined that a bit and said for him, it's important to choose who you get to be careful about who yes. you share with. And he said, you know, he said, I'm a sensitive person. Yes. And so, and I care a lot about what I'm doing, right? I'm not just whipping stuff out because I feel like yeah. I should write something. It's something I deeply care about. And so I'm, I first give it to people who I know are fans of my thinking and work. And I know that that first round of feedback is going to be positive. And then when I give it to the next round, I tell them what kind of feedback I want. You know, am I asking for, like, one of the things he will ask people to do is, does this sound like me? Does this writing sound like me? He might ask people, like, does this structure work? Are you engaged by, you know, having this part in the front and this part later? Um, so he'll, or, and then you have copy editors where you're asking for really, really precise feedback. I think, I think everyone who's here right now is choosing to be here, right? So everyone who's doing quarantine right now, because you're pretty much alone, you're choosing yeah. to be here. But we all sort of want each other in some way, like we want some kind of accountability. So these different types of people, you know, how, okay, if, if you are, are asking for someone to help you with accountability, does that change for each type? Like, who do you ask? Uh. Who does each of these four types ask and what kind of thing? And I know what kind of thing they're asking for, you're saying that var varies depending on other personality variables. Well, really only obligers need outer accountability. The other three kind of sometimes benefit from it or, or it might be useful to them, but they don't need it in the same way. Okay. Sometimes obligers feel like that's somehow a weakness of theirs or that it's, it's like not right that they need outer accountability. Like who cares? It's like a lot, it's, it's the biggest tendency for both men and women. If you need outer accountability, so do a ton of other people. Some of the most successful people in the world are obligers. So like just get it and move on. Um, 
So, so upholders t typically don't need outer accountability, though they might like it. Same with questioners, same with rebels. Rebels might chafe under outer accountability or they might enjoy it. The thing for obligers to realize is that they really do vary dramatically in what will work for them. And so like for some obligers, money is a great accountability. If I pay to go to a class, I'm gonna go. But then other obligers, they almost feel like they're off the hook. Like I talked to somebody who said, I realized with my trainer, if I don't go to my session, he gets the money and he gets the time back. And so she wasn't going because like to do him a favor. I'm like, that's not working for you. <laughs> but, but, with, but with writing, there's a lot of ways you can create outer accountability too. Like this is a great way. Obviously, you could also do something like if you have kids who have homework, you could say to them, well, I have my work and you have your work. And if you see that I'm not doing my work, you don't have to do your work. And your kids will be a policeman on you and you will have to do your work if you want your kids to do their homework. Or you could say to somebody, if I write five pages, like you can make a deal with your sweetheart and say, if I write five pages, you get to have your dessert tonight that you love so much. But if I don't write five pages, you have to skip dessert. And then you're like, well, I have to write my five pages or else I'm depriving somebody um, of something that's important. Or I know something about sugar. Somebody said that she made a deal that if she had dessert, her husband had to eat two portions and she didn't want him to eat all these sugary treats. Oh, that's then good. She, she didn't eat herself. So there's a lot of clever ways that people can can do it or, or also just doing it at the same time. Like we're all sitting here doing it at the same time. I feel like I need to do it to be part of what's happening in this group. That's a great way to create outer accountability. Um, group text, just checking in, just like, hey, did you do it? The, the idea is like, does somebody recognize and notice that you're doing it? Um, you can think of your duty to be a role model. Like maybe you have children at home again and you want to show them that like it's important to be able to sit down and do work. It's important to focus. It's important to stay off your devices. It's important to keep your promises to yourself. Um, maybe I'm writing this novel in my free time, but it's a promise that I've made to myself. And so I want to keep my promise to myself. Now, some obligers really like to do public. And um, this kind of goes back to the earlier question. Like they like to announce it and publish. Public. My sister is, a, is an obliger and she's like that. She'll often like sort of declare, like we have the happier uh, podcast together and she will often declare something because then she feels like she's like on the record doing it. Some people feel like it kind of loses its magic um, if they announce it. And so again, it's like, and you might just experiment if there's something that's really important to you. You know, you want to get started on this annual report, you know, you have, you know, so long to write it, but you'd be much better off if you started it now. What if due to your future self isn't working? Okay, try a group text with some colleagues. If that doesn't work, try doing it at this time with these folks. If that doesn't work, try the better app. If that doesn't work, try, I mean, just kind of cycle through everything until you find out what works for you. Because there is, there's so many tools to use for outer accountability, but they don't all work equally well for all obligers. Okay, and I'll, one last question and, and I'll let you go. Um, one of the things that keeps coming up as a that sort of divides people we started the very first tip was my tip which was to use the pomodoro technique of 20 yeah. or 25 minutes timed five minutes off another 20 to, to write in these you know um, focused structured intervals and i think that 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 works well for a lot of people but then we started getting into the idea of you know just brain dump like you just write just write something because you, you know, as Neil Gaiman said uh, last week, he said, you can't correct a blank page, but you can fix it, you know, a page that has something on it. But what keeps coming up is that some of us really have trouble writing sentences that feel imperfect. Some of us are copy editing as we go, or just editing as we go, and others are able to really just dump, dump, <laughs> like get mm -hmm. stuff on the page. Do you think that these, these types interact with that at all, with those differences? No, I mean, if I had big data, maybe there'd be correlation, but I suspect not. I think that that's just how some people work. And again, I don't think that sometimes people feel like, well, my way is the wrong way and yeah. I should do this other way. I remember we, we, we um, interviewed Roseanne Cash, you know, who's like the super famous, uh, successful mu musician. And she was saying how she, she I, and I, I was saying, you know, everybody should just do what works for them. There's no right way and a wrong way. And she said, oh, I'm so relieved because like, I thought everybody says to me, if you want to be like a creative person, you need to like treat it like a job and sit down at 10 a.m. and like sit at your desk and write songs. And I can never do that. And I'll just write them. And the other day, my husband found this like scrap of paper on top of the piano. And he's like, is this a song? This is amazing. And I had just like written it down at some random moment. And I was like, you're Roseanne Cash. 
whatever works for you is obviously right for you. Like, don't let anybody tell you that there's a better way or a right way. If you're being productive, if you're getting out what you want in the world in the way that feels right for you, don't let anybody tell you you should do it differently. But sometimes people have a way that isn't working for them. And so it's like, well, then experiment. That should appeal to you, Amy, as a, as a questioner. They love experiments. Try something else. Maybe saying, I, I, some people love to write things. I call them from beginning to end people. They start at the beginning, they write to the end, and then they're done. It's perfect all the way through. I write the whole thing all at once. I can't hand in the first chapter until the final chapter is done because I write the whole thing all at once. That works for me. If one way isn't working, maybe try the other way. Maybe, maybe you've kind of got into a habit that isn't as suitable to you or right now right. isn't working for this project, like something else might work. Um, but I do think that there's often this desire to tell people the right way, the most productive way. This is what the most creative people do. This is what the most successful people do. And I don't know if I'm, you, I'm sure you've read the book um, Daily Rituals by Mason Curry. And he details all of the daily habits of, you know, hundreds of highly successful people. And what you see is that some work early in the morning and some work late at night and some drink coffee and some drink vodka and some work in an empty studio far away from anybody and some work in a, the middle of a busy studio with a thousand people coming and going and some people work for a half an hour a day and some people work for 15 hours a day and what all these people share is they have figured out what they need yeah and they get what they need they right they that's, figure that's out, the commonality that's the thing they get what they need if they need that little studio in the woods they get the little studio in the woods if they need to be in the middle of the city with like a thousand people stopping by they're in the that, that's where their studio is and so i think i think a lot of times though we feel bad when something doesn't work for us we feel like there's something wrong with us instead of saying okay data point that's not working what can i try next okay that's great and i i think what, one of the great things about this book and i'm gonna hold it up again i know backwards but you can see um is one of my pet peeves honestly is leadership books that are focused on like these are the traits that you yes. need to be a great leader like it drives yeah. me crazy i start yeah. my leadership course uh, with a bunch of acronyms spelling out traits and i'm like is this the right set people are like yes and then i show them another one they're like that's the right set that's the right set but yes you can fit anything in, into yeah. these these traits there is no one set of traits so right. I love I love that you've offered us these four different types that that we can work with. You're not saying one of them is more successful than the other. No. You're saying figure out what you are, figure out what works for you, and and that's how you move forward. So thank you for that. And I think it's I can tell from the just the number of comments this is really helpful for people. Although a lot of people are asking about what to do about the rebel they live with. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> but, yes. Go go to my site. You will find many things there because. I've heard these questions before. And rebels, I love you. Don't ever think that I don't respect and honor the rebel tendency because I've learned so much from the rebels. But it is hard to live and work with people sometimes if, if every time you ask them to do something, they're very likely to resist. It just, it just, it's, it's a it's challenge tough. sometimes. It's tough. So I, I, before we go, I wanted to say, uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much for being here. Again, I can tell that people are really engaged. And do check out the quiz. Uh, can you give us the website again? Yes, it's quiz.gretchenrubin.com. It's free. It's very short. And like 2.8 million people have taken this quiz now. So, and, and it's great for you to have the data, too. I mean, you get Well, to... I don't look at that data because of the, sele uh, the selection bias. Uh, is, oh, and that, right, of course. Because and... I, ran, I, ran, I did like an actually, uh, because questioners always ask about this. Um, I did do like a uh, nationally representative survey to find out like what, like that obliger is the biggest tendency and rebel is the smallest tendency. Um, but I do like to see what, like I, I learn a lot from looking at the quiz, but I don't, when I talk about things like the different sizes of them, I do, ha I don't, I, I do know about the selection bias. Questioners are often telling me about the selection bias. Uh, so thank you. And tomorrow we have Sally Cohn, who wrote a book called The Opposite of Hate. And the, the book is kind of a memoir about her experiences. So she is a political writer and she, she, so she's a journalist. So a couple things that I love about having her on. One is that she's doing fast turnaround pieces in very stressful times about stressful topics that are divisive, right? So she, is, she gets, sorry, our dog is upset because an actual human just walked by and that's become so unusual now that he's like, what's going on? Uh, okay. <laughs> So it's okay. It's okay, Mayor. You're good. You're good. You don't have to protect us. So Sally 
is a journalist who has to turn things around quickly that are that are that can be divisive and that elicit backlash and love like so she gets a lot of love from some people and a lot of backlash and 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 bullying from other people and some actually really really incredibly nasty stuff so the opposite of hate is is a, a really great book about how she has dealt with online bullying and hatred by engaging with some of these people who have attacked her and what she has learned um, through that process. So she'll be on tomorrow, um, more great tips for you and another, you know, another writer's perspective. Uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in and I'll see you tomorrow at 11. Gretchen, thank you so much. And please do support these amazing guest writers who are giving so much of their time to doing this. I, it's, it's great. So check out all of Gretchen's work, although I know a lot of her fans are already here. All right, bye Gretchen, bye, bye everyone, so happy much. writing. So fun.